Great. Uh, could you uh, make me a co-host so I can share my screen? Yes. That'd be great. Thank you so much. I'll have some things to show these guys the next few days. And All right. Let's see. Uh, okay. Bring that up. All right. Let me open up the Zoom box again here. Every time I do a share screen, it gets a little wonky on my end. I think we're good now. Can everyone see that, uh, the, that PowerPoint, musical mindfulness? Great, fantastic. All right, so my name is Frank Diaz. Because we don't have a lot of time to get to know each other, I will do a brief introduction. It's good to know who you're working or talking with. So it just doesn't seem like some random guy that's just showing up on a Monday morning to help you out. So uh, a little bit about me. I am a bassist, double bassist and conductor. You can see my instrument back there. I try to practice um, as much as I can now with being at home and with, with a kid myself and teaching school. Um, I am a faculty member at Indiana University here in Bloomington at the Jacobs School of Music. I teach mindfulness here at IU to the music students through classes. I also teach it at several, I have taught it at several uh, universities across the country, including Florida State, uh, Case Western, USC. I usually do somewhere in the range of six to seven residencies a year at universities, and I teach at different places all over. So, so I get to teach this all the time. It's a lot of uh, fun for me, and I think really, really a meaningful work. I'm also a research lab um, a scientist in a way. I'm a psychological cognitive science uh, professor as well at IU, and I run a lab for musicians at Indiana University where we study uh, what helps musicians become better at what they do. Um, so we run a, a lab called the Music and Mind Lab here, which is part of IU. And then finally, I run a big institute. Uh, well, actually, it's not that big. Uh, it's a pretty nice size institute that teaches people how to uh, teach mindfulness to others that we run out of Bloomington and that has uh, members and teachers from all over the world, UK, Asia, and a lot of different places. So I get to do this a lot. It's gonna be kind of interesting this week to do this in a way that is uh, in meaningful for those of you that are just starting on your musical journey. And at the same time, meaningful for those of you that have been on your musical journey for a long time. So if at any point during this presentation, there's something you don't understand and you're like, what does that mean? Go ahead and just go, wait raise your hand uh, we will we will you'll have to learn a few things in order to learn how the practices work so just wanted to let you know that so the first thing is what is this mindfulness thing and we probably all have ideas about what this is but I like to make it a pretty simple thing to understand when people are mindful where we are in a particular state we're kind of approaching the world and our music making and what we're doing in a particular way and that way four ways to describe what happens during mindfulness. First is that we pay attention on purpose. So what that means is that sometimes we want to pay attention to something. If I want to pay attention to my finger, I look at my finger and that's perfectly reasonable. If I want to pay attention to a sound, I can pay attention to my sound, a sound. But sometimes things choose us, right? So sometimes I'm trying to pay attention to my finger, but my brain wants to pay attention to a banana or it wants to pay attention to a game I'm going to play later on, right? So in mindfulness, we learn how to pay attention on purpose. We try to strengthen that muscle. Become very aware of our senses, like touch, taste, uh, listening, uh, feeling. We become very aware of that and use that as a sort of way to figure out how to manage our emotions and our focus and the way that we play. Become aware of our thoughts, like what's going on in my head? If I'm going to play something really well, what kinds of thoughts are going to be more helpful to me? And then our feelings, which are really important. How do I feel at this moment? What does this feeling tell me about the way that I might play my instrument um, more effectively or less effectively? We learn to be curious rather than not than judgmental. This is very hard for musicians. Musicians are very judgmental about what they do. So in mindfulness, it's not that we say, oh, that's, you know, it doesn't matter if something is wrong or right or better or worse. What we do is we pause for a minute before we judge. And we say, okay, can I look at this kind of with a sense of curiosity? What's going on here before we make a judgment? Because sometimes we can start judging ourselves and judging our playing so harshly that it becomes very hard to actually play. Have any of you ever experienced very harsh judgments about your playing before you start? Man, I see some hands. Yeah, and they're hard, right? Once they start going, they're very hard to turn off, right? So there's some kind of interesting strategies that we'll work with to help you with that. And then finally, and I love this about mindfulness, it's about letting go of what we don't need in the moment. 
So what that means is, right, I might have a bad thought, or I might have something that I'm worried about, or I might have something that I'm thinking about, and all of that is perfectly fine. But maybe I don't need to think about that right now. Maybe at this moment, what I could do is use this time to focus on something else, right? So these four attitudes, these sort of four processes is what you learn when you're learning mindfulness, and you learn to strengthen them the way you strengthen a muscle, right? So if you're learning how to work with your left hand, eventually you start learning how to frame your left hand, you start learning finger patterns, if that's your thing, uh, you start learning patterns with your right hand. These are patterns of, of thinking that you can use in your own play and that are very helpful. Okay, let me move on. So how is it helpful before we get to our first practice today? One of the ways, there's actually five really interesting ways that this is helpful based on the musicians that I work with and on all the research that we've done over the last few years. First, it reduces unnecessary tension and anxiety. So I'll, I'll just, again, show of hands, how many of you experience unnecessary tension and anxiety when you play at some point? Yeah, we all do, right? And a little bit of tension, probably, okay, we, we all experience a little bit of that, and anxiety can be really, really hard. Anybody here get unfocused when they play at some point? You ever been in that situation when you're playing through something and you're about eight measures in and you go, where am I? <laughs> what just happened, right? Or you're in the middle of a lesson or a rehearsal and you go, wait, wait, what happened? So it really helps with your focus, especially if you do it every day, right? It promotes healthy practice habits. So one thing that I find is one exercise I'll teach you this week is called the mindful body scan. What happens is before you play, if, if you're not aware of where your body is positioned or how your chin is or how your shoulders are, it can become very easy to start playing and then all of a sudden feel like five minutes later, like, wow, I'm in a lot of pain. What's going on here, right? So being aware of the ways that we come into playing. So in other words, it, am I creating mental tension? Am I creating emotional tension? Am I creating physical tension? And having some tools to just stop and go, wait, that's not helping right now. Let me see how I can reset that. It's really important. And finally, uh, but not least important, I think it makes you more creative, right? And, and it helps you take perspectives. When you can be mindful, you can look at things from lots of different angles because you don't become so stuck on one way of looking at things. So it's kind of an interesting skill that way. I'm going to teach you five practices this week. I'm going to list them real quick, tell you what they're about, and we'll get to the first one. I'm going to teach you a practice called Breathe It Down, which is the one we'll work on today. And it is a simple breathing practice that I like to use before I start to play in order to get my mind and body in tune for whatever it is that I'm going to do. It also is really helpful for performance anxiety. So have any of you ever experienced the shakes before playing, especially in a recital or something like that? Yeah, I get the shake sometimes, and this is going to be really, this is a very easy technique that you can use to really help slow down the shakes. I'm going to teach you another one on focus called the bring the mind home, where you learn to give your mind an object to cling onto so that it doesn't spin away somewhere. And that'll be, uh, we'll do that tomorrow. Then the mindful scan and release on Wednesday, which will be sort of learning to look in our bodies and going, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, cool. I can either use this or not use it. Something called mindful stop on Thursday, which is going, what am I thinking about right now? is this useful for me? Is this really a useful thought? Could I think of something else that might be useful? And then finally on Friday, we're gonna talk about self-compassion, which is about being nice to yourself, right? M musical journeys are long. We spend so much of our lives uh, playing music if, you, if, you're in, you know, if you're a serious musician like you are. And we wanna be kind to ourselves because yes, we can be judgmental and get better, but we can also be kind to ourselves and just get better because we love what we do without having to beat ourselves up so bad, right? People who beat themselves up might get better, but over time it really starts to take a cycle logical toll on you. So we'll work on all of this this week. Okay, who's ready for the first practice? You guys ready to do this? All right, so here's the key. I'm going to show you this real quick before we started so you understand what's happening here. There's something really uh, interesting about uh, the body uh, that you might have learned called uh, you have parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system. Whoa, big words. I got it. And they're probably two big words for the Monday. But really, um, this has to do with the idea of fight or flight. So I want you to imagine that all of a sudden you're in a room and uh, you're just kind of hanging out, you know, doing your, doing your work, and all of a sudden a tiger walks into the room. Um, what, what do you think might happen to your body if you all of a sudden noticed a giant tiger <laughs> move into your room? <laughs> yeah, any, any idea? I know what would happen to me. I would probably freeze. I'd probably go, ah, like what, is, right? Like your whole body, I'd probably start sweating. Um, but you know what's interesting? Some people don't. Some people actually like get excited. They want to like 
fight, right? Like they run. Uh, I would not fight the tiger just to be 100% clear. If the tiger's coming to the room, I highly recommend you run out of there as quickly as possible. Uh, but I can be in a situation where a lot of us, you know, you or I can respond very differently, right? So there are two systems in your body that you have no control over, except I'm going to teach you one way to hack that system. The parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and this is what happens when you are, um, when you're kind of sort of sleeping, right? So like you, you're like, oh, I'm going to fall asleep. Your parasympathetic nervous system starts to turn on. You feel relaxed. You feel focused. It feels nice, right? And then the sympathetic nervous system is the one we're sort of being careful about. That's the one that can get activated if we're not, you send signals to your brain that goes, you're in danger, okay? The nerve that connects that is called the vagal, vagal nerve. And it's a nerve that connects from your brain stem to the rest of your body. And it's kind of like a highway. It sends signals from your body to your brain and back and forth. And there's one way to control it that we know of outside of using medicine, which is to learn how to control the way that you breathe so that you send a signal to your, to your uh, nervous system that says, everything's cool. You're going to be okay. So this is called breathe it down. I'm going to teach you three versions of it this morning that you can try. By the way, how many of you have an instrument nearby? I have an instrument nearby. Okay, cool. When we do the third version of this, I want you to grab your instrument and play along. I, we don't need to hear you, but it'll be cool to try it that way. Okay. All right. Are you guys ready for four, seven, eight breath? I'm going to show you what I do first. And so I'm going into a practice room. I'm all skittish or freaked out about what happened. And I really want to bring my temperature down. I'm going to breathe it down. And so what we do, as we start to we do what's called measured breathing. So through our nose, everybody point at their nose for a minute, make sure it's, it's really important to understand you gotta breathe through your nose first. You breathe in for four counts. You hold your breath kind of like you're a giant balloon suspended in the air for seven counts. And then here is the key. On the way out, you breathe through your mouth and you push out the sound by making this sound. You guys hear that? That's a whoosh. How does one make a whoosh? You put your tongue behind your teeth. So can everyone just do that? Just put your tongue behind your teeth and go. Right? Now, why do I put my tongue behind my teeth? Because it's kind of like a brake, right? It's like a bicycle brake. If, if I, it's a way of slowing down the air. If I just try to hold my breath and blow my air out, it's a lot harder to do without a little stop right there, right? It also makes a whooshy sound, which your brain interprets as calm, right? It's very interesting. We like whooshy sounds when we were babies. Our moms or, da or dads held us and went, what? Shh, 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 right? So there's something deep in our brainstem that really likes that whooshy shh type of sound that helps us feel relaxed and calm. All right. So I typically do this with a metronome, uh, but we don't have to do it with a metronome. We can just count. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a tempo. Can you all hear my clicking finger? Okay. And in that, we're going to breathe in for four. We're going to hold for seven and we're going to whoosh out very slowly for eight. I'm going to go a little faster because some of you are probably doing this for the first time. You guys want to try it? So we're going to do about four cycles of this. Okay. Four cycles. All right. So sit up nice and tall. Take one deep breath in. Let it go. And let's try a little four, seven, eight. Here we go. Ready? And in two, three, four, hold two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, relax. Let's try it again. Ready? And in two, fill up your belly, three, four, Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax. We're going to do two more. And in, two, fill up, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whoosh, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax. And the last one. In two, three, four. Hold two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoosh. Two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, relax. And just for 30 seconds, just notice your breathing. Don't do anything. Just notice your breathing and any sounds that are in the room right now. Okay. All right, I want you to raise your hand if you feel a little more relaxed than you did when you started this exercise physically. Yeah, that should feel a little more relaxed. Has anyone noticed if their thoughts have slowed down a little bit? Anybody notice slower thoughts? Yeah, interesting, huh? Something about the way that really triggers our nervous system that helps slow our thoughts down. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I go into a situation, my brain is racing. There's just too many thoughts and it feels a little overwhelming. So sometimes by just being able to breathe it down, I can slow the thoughts down a little bit so I can handle them, right? So that they're not so overwhelming. How many of you noticed sounds in the room at the end of that exercise that you were like, oh, I didn't realize that sound was happening in my room, like a hum or a buzz or anything like that. Did anyone notice the sound in the room? Yeah? Oh, okay, yeah, Kaylin did. Yeah, sometimes there's a lot of sounds around us that we're not noticing. Um, and sometimes by slowing down and activating that uh, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, we can hear a little bit better. And it's really interesting when I do this as a conductor, all of a sudden my hearing changes. I hear things in the room that I wasn't hearing before. And more importantly for me as a musician, I hear parts that maybe were there, but are all of a sudden a lot clearer because I've cleared up some space. This is sort of like cleaning the attic of your mind, right? You want to clean out enough space that you have plenty of musical processing. Okay, you could do this with breathing and you can see how effective that could be. If you feel like you need to be calmer, you can do two, two more of those. For me, it takes me seven tries to calm down. I have to do seven cycles. So if I'm going to go conduct or teach a class and I'm really worked up, I'll be like, okay, I need seven of these right before I start. Sometimes I do it with my students. In an orchestra, sometimes I'll just say, hey, let's just do this together to calm down a little bit and get focused. I do it with college students. It works just as well. They like it. It doesn't matter. I do it with my colleagues sometimes when I play with them. So it really doesn't matter what age you are or what situation. This is a really good breathing exercise for anyone. All right. Now I'm going to teach you how to do this a different way. And this, this is by using your instrument. And I like this because it adds a sound component. So if you guys want to grab your instrument real quick, uh, go ahead and grab it and come back. I'll give you a minute or two. And if you don't have an instrument, that's okay. You can just do the breathing again, or you can, yay. You got instruments, cool. Uh, it's okay if you don't have one. Um, Sarah, are m most of the string players, or we also have some pianists? Um, who's a pianist? Yeah, there's both. There's, there's quite a few pianists too. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so this is an, I'll do an interesting variation for pianists. Which is, which is kind of cool. All right, uh, so there's string players and pianists. Okay, string players. So here's what we're gonna do, and then I'm gonna explain the piano version of this. So the pattern is still four, seven, eight. Okay, we're still gonna do four, seven, eight. We're still gonna breathe, but we're gonna add a really interesting component that's gonna help us sort of focus our minds on sound a little bit. So for if you're a string player, what I want you to do is pick a comfortable open string. So you can pick your, uh, depending on what instrument you play, play a really resonant open string on your instrument. So uh, for me, I, I like to play on my D string on the bass. It just feels nice and rich and full or on my A string. And what you'll do is you'll set the bow at the frog, okay? Very relaxed and you're gonna breathe in on a down bow for four counts. You're gonna try to get that same tempo. So it's gonna be down, two, three, four. You're going to hold the bow, so you're going to stop, hold for four counts. We're changing the, the count pattern a little bit. And then you're going to exhale up for eight counts on an up bow. And then what you do is when you get to the end is just listen to the ringing of the sound. 
just sort of listen and, and feel the vibration in the instrument. So this gets your brain grounded on something very physical and sensory, right? So again, you're going to come down for four, hold for four, and then uh, exhale out eight counts on an up bow. And then you're going to pause and you're just going to listen to the vibration on that open string. Okay. If you can't hear the vibration, you can feel just resonance in your instrument. Just kind of connect to what you're, you're feeling and hearing on the instrument. If you're a pianist, what I want you to do is to pick two separate chords. Okay. Three finger chords. It doesn't matter which ones they are. Major, minor, it really is okay. But I want you to do, you, you take a breath and you go play two, three, four, hold two, three, four. And then on your left hand, play another chord for the exhalation. So you are synchronizing your right and left hand. On the onset of your right hand, you're gonna breathe in for four, you're gonna hold for four, and then on the exhalation, on the count one, you're going to play a chord on your left hand. They don't have to be the same chords, it just, this is more about the feeling and resonance of the instrument than it is about any specific chord. You guys wanna try that? We also have a flute and saxophone. Oh, sweet, so flute or saxophone, do this on any long tone that you want. So pick a nice long tone, take a, a deep breath in, right? And then on the exhalation, you're going to play the note, right? So you don't play on the inhalation. You hold on the inhalation, right? Hold for four counts. And then the exhalation, play the note, right? So the, 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 for wind players, it's a little bit different. You guys want to try this? You ready? and hold and then exhale for eight right and you can by the way you can switch chords and you can switch open strings it doesn't matter but start with one and then if you want to switch to another one you can do that afterwards you ready to do this here we go ready and in two three four stop two three four Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax, listen to the sounds, feel the instrument. Reset your hand if you need to. Here we go, let's do it again. Ready? And in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax. Do one more. Ready? And in, two, three, four, hold, two, Three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Listen. Relax. Okay, so not only is that a good exercise for breathing, it's also a good exercise for bow control, <laughs> right? As you've got eight counts, so some of you got to that frog really quickly. Um, and it, it this at least helps you go, okay, okay, I got to hold it out just a little bit more. All right. Was anything different when you used this exercise with sound? Were there any differences? You're like, yeah, this was a little different this time. Um, anybody want to describe what that might have been like? We've got just a couple minutes. Any volunteers? Okay. You always uh, so. unmute yourself for chat, too, if you want to. I noticed one thing that I forgot to breathe on the first one at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, which is which is not uncommon. And by the way, we're used to string players to breathe and then exhale usually on the, right? So it's a little different. It's a little different strategy, right? And this is not something I would do when I'm playing necessarily as part of my playing practice. It's just a way of synchronizing sound with the bow. But yeah, if I'm playing my bass, I usually take a breath and then release into the string, right? And this is a slightly different process than what we would typically do. Did anybody feel the same sort of calming effect at the end when there was sound there? Was there still a little bit of calm at the end? Oh, Clay did, yeah, cool. Yeah, Sarah did. And the reason I like this is that it helps it, you know, I don't have to come in and do some strange breathing exercises that has nothing to do with music. I'm immediately 
making some sounds and making some music, right? Getting my ears accustomed to that, right? So it's really, really, really helpful. Okay, so there's one more variation. We don't have enough time to do it, but um, I'll show you really quickly what I do. Another way of doing this to give your brain a place to center is I blow air at my center knuckle of my index finger. So I put it right above, right near my face. I take a deep breath in, hold, and then I blow air at the center knuckle. And what's cool about that is you can hear the sound bouncing off your finger, right? So it immediately creates a sound. It also gives your brain, it, it adds a certain type of muscle focus where it says, if your brain has a very clear target, it tends to gather in a different way than it, if it has a really big target. Like, I'm going to go in a room and be aware of everything. That's, the brain functions in one particular way when you do that. But it also functions really nicely when you tell it, I want you to focus on this one thing. And when you do that, it gathers in a different way. It strengthens different kinds of muscles. So this is just a really basic exercise for today. Tomorrow, I'm going to extend this a little bit more. We're going to do this with some sound uh, and do this. Uh, it's called Bring the Mind Home, which is a really interesting um, exercise that you can do when you're doing long tones or exercises or that you can do right before you start. And it's kind of like a basic mindful breath awareness exercise. Okay, I hope that was helpful or useful for you as you go through the day. Um, remember, you can do this anytime. So if you're feeling a little weird and you wanna tell your professor or your teacher or whoever, and you say, hey, can I do just a little four, seven, eight here? I'm sure they'll, first you can teach them, which I'm sure they would appreciate. They'd be like, oh, what are you doing there, right? But you can just also take a little time for yourself to calm down and be in the moment as you start your day. Okay, thank you so much. I will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I miss Sarah. I miss Diaz. Bye. Thanks for coming, everybody. See you all tomorrow. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. See you. Awesome. Great. Yeah, hopefully well, that was okay for yeah, the age that was, group. That was perfect. That was per I loved how you incorporated the instruments. And um, I actually just had a student yesterday ask me about breath, and she's doing the Mendelssohn concerto. Oh. And during the, you know, talk, thinking about really difficult parts, how you hold your breath and how to use breath, maybe in open strings or in scales, to then get to the point where you can use breath in a really technical passage. Yeah. Um, yeah, it takes a while to sort of learn how to, you know, deliberately manipulate the breath for some, for something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, it was, I, I knew you told me there were little kids, but the, the hardest thing about that is using language that is engaging enough for the older players, but isn't get them, you know, doesn't get the little ones lost. Fortunately, I have a seven-year-old, so I know <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay. It is. <laughs> but I think they all know that it's going to be geared at, you know, middle school, high school, um, but yeah, you know, all the all the younger kids that have come, I think there's just one on that call that's six. Yeah. Um, but he's been great at every workshop. That's great. So, that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll do four more this week, and you guys will have a, a little arsenal of practices that you can use in the studio, and hopefully, hopefully awesome. they'll get some. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.